So again, thanks for inviting me. Um, I am honored to be able to follow Martin Duraki with his really interesting talk. Um, uh, and so this is, I guess, changing tack. We're going to go and uh, think about this from really what the, you know, the, the, the name of the workshop, which is on fairness and bias, which is, as Mike has said, something I've been uh, thinking about for a long time. And um, I was looking into this problem when it wasn't a problem, right? <laughs> and so in, in 2007 and 2008, uh, Vinay and I started thinking about the bias uh, that systems impose, uh, but apparently uh, that wasn't a problem back then. Um, so, 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 <laughs> so ironically now it's like taken off, right? And so today I wanna to talk to you about this idea about the fairness hypothesis and essentially that is something that uh, Colin and I, uh, who's my, who was my PhD student at the time, sort of put together after working with this idea of retrievability. And the fairness hypothesis is essentially stating that a fairer information retrieval system will provide better retrieval performance. So I think that's a quite, a, quite, a, um, quite an assertion to make. Right, and obviously it requires on what do we mean by fairer and what do we mean by better, right? And so in, in this talk, uh, I'm gonna talk about what one of the, the ways that we can kept conceptualize uh, fairness or bias, bias um, in, in terms of information retrieval from a very document centric kind of point of view, but it can also be applied to, to different groups as well. Um, but you know, maybe, uh, maybe people have uh, some thoughts on whether they think that, you know, fairer is better, right? You know, will, will being fairer actually lead to better performance? Um, and to think about that, I don't know whether when it, if everyone wants to put their hand up and say anything, but you, you're more than will, willing to, more than welcome to actually uh, interact and tell me your thoughts. So, if we haven't got any uh, takers, uh, then we'll continue and say, well, how, okay, so what we need to do is work out how, what we mean by fairer. Um, and so uh, it all sort of started uh, evolving around this idea that Hansen proposed uh, a long time ago when he developed what they call accessibility uh, metrics applied to uh, transportation and land use. And he made this proposition that access shapes land use. And thinking about this from a, from, from, from you know, like thinking about uh, opportunities within a physical space, we took this metaphor and applied it to the information space and hypothesized that the access you have shapes your information use. So if you have access to an object, you can now use that object, you know, the piece of information. And this is where like Morville was sort of suggesting that uh, an item has no value unless it can be found, which is essentially the, the premise of findability, right? And so I'd just like to point out that obviously back then they were thinking about this in the, in the physical space. And so here's a map of uh, uh, London, and this is an accessibility uh, map. And so you can see that the, the red in the center of the, the screen denotes that people have high accessibility. So uh, it denotes that about like when it's really red, about 50% or so of people, um, you know, so, so it says that the, the you have uh, access to like 50% of the jobs within an hour uh, commute from those regions. But if you go out to the sticks, out onto the, 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 the you know, the far away where you get the blue, you, you know, within an hour, you only have access to about one, you know, less than 1% of the jobs, right? And so what we, what we thought about was how do we take this idea of accessibility and port that into an information space and then think, okay, well, how easily can we access particular opportunities? These opportunities are items, they're documents within our information space. And so we can kind of think about like a query as a bus route, for instance, or a metro route. And that query has a number of stops, the ranking that we uh, will we'll go through, right? And so the further away the, the document is or further down the line the, the document is, the less accessible or the less retrievable that item is, right? And so, uh, and then so if you have more paths coming in to a particular, you know, the city has lots of uh, routes going in and out of it. So it becomes more accessible because you have more, you know, metro routes and bus routes in there. And similarly with an item or a document, 
And so uh, we're just going to walk through how we can, how this metric essentially works. And, it's, and basically it's the premise of most of the um, ensuing metrics uh, in, in other campaigns. So essentially uh, Vinay and I um, propose this idea of retrievability uh, based on accessibility uh, metrics from transportation planning, which is thinking about, well, how easily can I access a document given a information retrieval system? And then we wanted to try and quantify that because we were observing that some documents, um, actually from work that Martin uh, and I did with Christian Balog, uh, we were observing that some items are very easy to find uh, when we were running particular simulations. And some items were very, very hard to find. Uh, Vinay was coming at, at it from a sort of clustering point of view, thinking about the clusterability of items. And we were thinking about it from um, a, a sort of a, an evaluation point of view and how you can uh, find node items in a space. <clears throat> and so obviously, you know, depending on the density of your information space, it depends on how hard you can get it. So if you have lots of items about say Britney Spears, then it's really hard to pinpoint the one or the, the Britney Spears document that you're actually interested in. And yes, I know I'm going back into time, but that's that, that's who was popular back then. <clears throat> so obviously there are a number of different factors that affect uh, how easily you can get a different uh, item, uh, the indexing process. So uh, Lawrence and Giles pointed out, um, you know, even, even, even earlier, like in the early 2000s, uh, that if you don't, if your document isn't indexed, well, you can't retrieve it through the search engine. Uh, so that's a, that's a key barrier. So uh, in order to make more items accessible, you need to actually get them into the index. And that's where sort of Google actually had an advantage over the other uh, search systems by actually just sucking in more stuff and letting you uh, potentially get there. Uh, the documents in the index themselves and the features, like I said about Britney Spears, if we have millions of documents about Britney Spears, then it's a lot harder to find the particular document about Britney Spears that you want. And then obviously how they're being uh, indexed or characterized. And so if we take multimedia documents versus textual documents uh, and we're using keyword search, then the multimedia document is a lot harder to access because we don't necessarily have the metadata associated with that. Of course, nowadays with machine learning, we have a lot more uh, annotations for those items to allow greater access uh, to them. The characteristics and the features of the document itself versus with respect to the, the, the collection is also an important um, uh, delineator, right? And then the retrieval system itself. So, you know, the AI that we're putting into our matching function in order to take the person's query and then match it to uh, the documents that we have available, which then forms a ranking. But interestingly enough, uh, retrievability is also uh, dependent upon a user and you know, their ability to, to formulate queries, right? Um, and their willingness to actually go through um, uh, the, the ranked document. So if I'm only willing to travel, uh, commute uh, 30 minutes a day, then uh, that will preclude me from certain job opportunities in a physical space, just like we find in the, in the information spaces, people are only willing uh, to, to examine so many documents. Right. Um, and, you know, the further down the, the list, the less likely they, they are to go there. Right. And so they also uh, affect this. Now we can sort of formulate this um, <clears throat> notion, right? That given a particular information system, we have a universe of documents, uh, D, and then we have a universe of all possible queries that people could even conceive of issuing to the system. And then we could work out some estimate of the retrievability of a particular document, RD, as the summation over all the possible queries uh, multiplied by the probability of you issuing that query. So issuing um, something like, Britney Spears or George Bush or, you know, um, you know uh, and the like is much more uh, likely than say issuing uh, my name, life as a party, right? Uh, and so then you have this uh, F function, which is a discounting function, which is essentially encoding the user model about whether they're likely to hit that item. So given the kth item, and there's different ways to express this discount, which is very much like the user models that we have within um, uh, our standard evaluation metrics. 
So let me just explain that a little bit. So we can think about having this cumulative discount function, which just says, I'm only willing to look at the top 10 or top K documents. So the, the, that function, this discount function would just return one if it's less than uh, K, uh, otherwise it would return zero. So this is kind of building up like a cumulative um, uh, retrievability metric or simply counting the number of times this document has come back given our universe of queries. Oh, we can also encode like the, the discounting function, something like DCG um, or, or RBP, which is a gravity-based uh, discount function. And these are actually um, derived directly from the accessibility uh, measures that Hansen proposed, um, you know, oh geez, you know, 60 years ago now, uh, where we have a discount. So we have this beta discount, which says that the further down the list, the less likely someone is to access that. Um, and they, they, they broadly tell us the same thing, um, but uh, they, there are some nuances uh, in that when, we, when, we, when we've actually measured them. Now, given that we can uh, imagine that we have this universe of queries and we can then uh, issue them all and then we can uh, uh, analyze our space, then intuitively what retrievability is saying is that if we have lots of queries which retrieve that document, then the uh, retrievability of it's gonna be high. Uh, if we, have, if we have a smaller set, but they have a very high probability of being issued, then that will boost the retrievability. Um, and when uh, the documents are high enough in the list, so it's either in the top K or it's in the top set of documents, then they're much more, uh, they will give, give a boost to retrievability uh, as well. And so what we observe is that uh, when we do these simulations is that some documents become very retrievable and some documents are kind of left out. And so just to give you a hint about how this, this happens is we, we take a, a fixed query set, we put, push it through system A, we push it through system B, and essentially look at all the documents that come back uh, given their ranks, and then say for a particular document, so here we have uh, you know, document one given system A, and it may have come back say 10 times in the top 10, and document two uh, has come back uh, 15 times in the top 10 given all our queries. And then we can compare that to how our retrievable our system B makes uh, the, the documents. So here system B saying that the first document comes back 20 times versus system uh, and document two comes back only five times. So now we can compare relatively uh, the retrievability between them. So here uh, system B is saying that you know, it's making uh, document D1 uh, twice as retrievable as A, uh, and it, but it makes um, document B three times less retrievable, right? Uh, and we can also obviously aggregate overall, you know, for a particular group, if we know that document one and two are, you know, document ones are for, you know, male authors and document two is for uh, female authors, then we can then obviously sum over um, all of those and, and compare groups. But it allows us then to see whether there is differences between uh, the, the, the bias or, or the retrievability that the system is, it, is expressing upon the documents in the collection. Of course, there are different ways we can uh, estimate the retrievability. And so often we, we, we will generate synthetic queries. And then, and, and by doing so, we're saying, oh, let's just create a whole series of queries, like random, you know, pick out all the bi, bi, bigrams, you know, um, and then issue those to the system and then work out where the, what the retrieval ability is. And that's essentially asking a question that says, what retrieval opportunities does this system afford? So um, where, what, you know, where can this transportation system, our IR system, which allows us to transport our, ourselves into a, a information space, where does it let us go, right? But we can also ask a different question. We can say, well, what retrievability option opportunities are presented to the user? Where are we letting uh, you know, people go given what they ask? And so here we can uh, use actual query logs to submit those to the systems and then see which items are being recommended over and over again or presented to our um, users, right? And so now we have actually two very, very different points of view uh, on the system. It's where people are, are sort of going and where people can go. 
And so when we when we do these analyses, and here you know we, I've ranked the you know this is obviously a simulation, so we've ranked the documents by how retrievable they are, and what we see is that there are a whole bunch of documents that are generally unretrievable. They just don't come back in the simulations. It's not to say that you know if you maybe ran more queries, they wouldn't come back, but it's suggesting that there's that, that, that they don't come back right in the simulation and then you find there's a so sort of this middle ground where they're lowly retrievable and they get some retrievability and then we also see that then that there is a whole bunch of documents that seem to um become very retrievable given our uh, our system so maybe if we were using a, a retrieval system like tfidf which has a known length bias then uh we can do subsequent analysis to see that you know the, these highly retrievable documents just tend to be longer documents and if we add in the pivot normalization or move to bm25 then we can start to actually um re the the number of uh, retrieval opportunities afforded uh, through the retrievability statistics to these these documents is decreased right um, and then if we were to issue a query log <clears throat> we'll see that you know users themselves are actually expressing a particular bias on the system this is the stuff i want given your collection and so what this actually does is tends to skew uh the the, the analysis a little bit further because that's where people would like to go now the theory is in x in, in um obviously that's that the way they're being uh, recommended to or, or the rankings that are being provided is conditioned on this base, um, this sort of base um, retrievability that the system provides, right? Uh, because if you see an item that, that's being very retrieved, then it's more likely to be retrieved in, in the future, right? The, the kind of idea of rich gets uh, richer. But in, from taking from uh, transportation planning theory, they actually say that you sort of you should sort of match up the supply. So the red line is what we consider the supply. This is where uh, the, the system is uh, trying to allowing people to go to easily. And we should try and match up that supply with the demand about where people would like to go and do so as uh, efficiently as possible. Right. And essentially, when you think about machine learning, what it's doing when ranking, it's trying to find this mapping between queries and destinations and trying to so that it minimizes the cost or the effort uh, of a, that a user requires in order to find an item, right, by bringing the, the most relevant item up to the top to present to them, right, and making it more accessible, more retrievable. So we can also, you know, look at systems and quantify how many retrieval opportunities that they provide by taking the summation um, over all the documents. And we can also look at um, estimating, you know, or working at how many uh, documents are actually given the opportunity to be retrieved, right? So you can think um, now that, well, okay, if we're only retrieving a certain proportion um, of, of items, then uh, we're actually saying we're just excluding these other ones. Right, um, right. Uh, the other way that we can use this retrievability metric is to quantify the, the bias that a system expresses over in a, a total collection by using e inequality metrics from uh, socioeconomics, right? And so the, the most famous one is the Gini coefficient. And so here I've got the Lorenz curve. So this is, we take the, the cumulative retrievability scores, we rank them, rank all the documents by their retrievability and then we um, accumulate and so we have sort of two regions the a and the b and so the gini coefficient is essentially this area divided by the total area and so if the uh, uh, if the gini coefficient is one it means that this red line is all the way down the bottom and goes up so it's like the king he owns gets all the money one document gets everything and everyone else has uh, no retrievability and a fair system means that everybody is equal so they're all along the, the this uh, line here and so then that would be uh, totally e e e equality. So more like sort of Sweden, where everyone gets a very similar amount of money, all the ideals behind Sweden. Right. And so what we see is that obviously different retrieval retrievability systems have different um, curves. Uh, and so the, the closer it is to this bottom right corner, the more biased it, it, it is. Right. It's expressing more bias on the collection and making uh, a lot more documents. Um, highly retrievable and a few documents highly retrievable and everyone else uh, not very retrievable at all, right? And, and, and larger that that doesn't bode well for performance. 
Like I said, we can also apply this ID to groups. We can take a group of documents, work out their average retrievability of group X and versus the average retrievability of group Y, uh, and then be able to compare whether um, you know, the system is favoring you know, male authors over female authors or what have you. So now that I've kind of put for the pro proposition uh, of retrievability and how we can take different uh, measures over like the number of uh, retrieval opportunities it affords, how it distributes those retrievability uh, opportunities in terms of Gini and the number of um, uh, retrieval opportunities that a system even gives, um, we can now start thinking about uh, how we can link this idea to uh, what an ideal system would be, right? But I think it also opens up these other questions, which is, you know, you know, are there documents in the collections that are more retrievable than others? Well, we, we actually observe that in practice. Uh, you know, there are certain documents that have almost no retrievability and other ones that have a lot. Um, and then it makes us think about these higher order questions about how much retrievability or access should be afforded to each of the documents in our collection. And so over the years, there's been a whole series of different findings that do show that systems are biased in various ways. Some are more biased than others. Reducing the retrievability bias does tend to lead to an increase in performance and in terms of retrieval performance. However, when you get to very high levels of performance, often uh, there's a trade-off between uh, the retrievability bias quantified by Gini and the performance. Interestingly, by removing low retrievability documents, just chucking them away, uh, actually has minimal impact on, on performance. And if that's not intuitively obvious why, then it's basically saying the system is actually telling us, I'm not retrieving these documents. I don't think they're useful. I'm not gonna retrieve them. So if you ditch them, it's not gonna really matter because it's not affecting your top rankings. However, uh, what we have seen though, is that a user has, uh, has the ability to overcome system biases in different ways. And the first one is just by going simply going deeper into a ranking. You can start to mitigate uh, the bias, and and the and and it becomes um, it, 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 it mitigates the the bias of the ranking. And if they issue more specific and and actually longer queries, they can probe exactly what they're actually asking for, and that again can also uh, reduce the bias within the system as well. So this leads on to really the, the sum, summation right, uh, of, of this talk, which is fairer systems. And you know, should we try to be building these fairer systems? Remind you that we were talking about the, the fairness hypothesis, which is saying that a fairer information which system will perform better. Largely empirical results tend in that direction, but it does break down, right? But what do we mean by this fairer or ideal kind of retrieval system that we have in mind? Well. First of all, I think it needs to be able to maximize the total number of retrieval opportunities afforded to the collection. So this is maximizing this R sum idea, right? So if you think about a Boolean N query, it will uh, not it will retrieve a smaller subset, whereas an OR query will retrieve a lot more items. And so thus, you know, if you're only retrieving, if you retrieve nothing or you retrieve uh, a, a truncated result set, you're not giving out as many opportunities as you possibly could for your set of queries. And you know, that's a, definitely a, a concern um, in terms of um, uh, uh, pattern search, but also what um, you know, the, the basic accessibility metrics that Lawrence and Giles uh, were doing, get more into the collection, make sure you can retrieve stuff. We can also think about trying to maximize the number of items that are retrievable. So that's maximizing this NDR, the number of non-zero retrievable items in our collection, right? So now we have all these opportunities, we've maximized that. Now we want to try and maximize the number of items that get returned. And then the third point here is that uh, we should try and then distribute those retrieval opportunities across our collection as equally as possible in order to minimize uh, the, the bias or the Gini coefficient. Now, all this is premised on using a non-random IR function. And the reason for that is because, um, you know, we can obviously uh, just randomly retrieve documents and that would equally distribute all these retrieval opportunities everywhere, but the, you'd lose out on terms of, on terms of performance um, because, you know, you're just randomly going into spaces, right? 
Um, and so we are assuming this non-random IR function. And so that's what I was saying about the mapping between the, the AI is trying to learn a mapping to try and find the most efficient one. But what we don't want it to do is overly uh, direct people to certain items um, in, in that space or give them more retrieval opportunities than they need for people to access the, those opportunities uh, efficiently. And so <clears throat> this is where the premise is that if we were to take this um, system and what if we were trying to make uh, all, all, all those documents as equal as possible so we can kind of reduce the bias across the collection, right? Does that even make uh, sense to do that, <clears throat> right? Uh, well, you know, so we have these two systems, so we have the less biased one and the highly biased one, right? You know, and if we were trying to reduce the bias, maybe move the, the, the system to the less biased system or even push it down so it affords more retrieval opportunities across the collection, uh, then why does it give uh, the, the, why does it make sense to try and subscribe to this notion of the fairness hypothesis? Right. <clears throat> and so this leads to the uh, intuition behind it, which I think we can say that imagine we have a document which is down here uh, and that's not getting retrieved by our red or purple system. Um, then under these systems, and it's very, very unlikely that the user will be able to find this document if it was ever relevant in the future. And presumably the reason why we're indexing this document is because we think it's going to be relevant to someone at some time, at some point. But these two systems aren't offering uh, any opportunity to retrieve it. But our basically our, our sort of unbiased kind of system, again, assuming that's a non-random matching function, will afford it some possibility. So that means if in the future, at some time, a user was as to ever want that document, right, then they could potentially pose queries or there would be a series of queries or a query that would allow them to actually get that doc document, right? And so that's essentially the intuition uh, behind the fairness, um, uh, behind the um, fairness hypothesis, right? Um, often when we have test collections, we only um, have um, a very small subset of queries that are issued into a very, very large space. And so they may not generalize to all possible queries uh, within our collection. Of course, the trick, like I said, is to try and match the right documents to the right queries and not to overly uh, emphasize that. And I think that's the risk that we run when we're sort of tuning our systems to either the, where the population is being directed and keeps looking at, right? And that skews the, the distributions um, versus, you know, fighting, trying to midi mediate out those opportunities across the, 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 the space, right? Um, but, I guess also a question is like, you know, does it really make sense that we should be trying to make everything equally retrievable, right? Because let's consider these two pages here. Let's say that someone's uh, asking a question about whether uh, aloe vera is to cure cancer. And on the left-hand side, I guess, we have the cancer research page, right? And it's telling us that the, the cancer is not really cured by aloe vera, but it can be useful to treat some of the side effects from it. And on the right-hand side, you can clearly see that there's, a, there's, this, it's, there's this paper claiming that you can cure cancer with aloe vera, right? Now, you know, now we have to start thinking about, well, what is the value of these two items? And, you know, do we really want to make this item accessible at all? You know, is it, you know, should our system, I think it was an interesting point from Martin's uh, talk was that, you know, uh, systems should be, be accurate, right? They should be returning uh, information that's correct. And you know there is not very much evidence to support these claims, as um, you know, as the the Cancer Research Foundation actually points out. So often, I, th I think it's coming back to the think about well, we we really need to be thinking about well, what is the value of the information that we have, right? So I'll just I'll I'll, I'll end it uh, on that point. Um, is to basically think about like the the thinking about the value of the different uh, items that we have in the space and how the system is actually telling us what it thinks is valuable where uh, where we where, where when we see the users with who are looking in the space are trying to find value in that space and whether the system itself is actually you know so, so I'm just saying the system itself through the retrievability analysis is essentially showing us or saying, what it thinks is valuable to the user, right? And so now we have this, we can think about the, the judgments we want to make according, accordingly, right? 
And so just a final advertisement on a different type of uh, different types of biases in search here uh, while we hand over to Micah. Thanks a lot and thank you for this very interesting talk. Um, we don't really have time for questions, but there is one that is a really short one, so I want to read out that and then we continue with the next speaker. It comes from Kanat Patak, and if he asks if we index some documents that happen to be behind a paywall, and uh, and the document behind the paywall is highly relevant to the cur curry, then how do we rank it given it is less accessible? Should we rank it to top or bottom? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good question, right? So that's another type of uh, accessibility problem is actually getting into the to the content itself, right? And so you could think about the cost function we you know encoded in the retrieval metrics, the retrievability metrics is like the the, the idea of distance going down a ranking. Um, but once you put a payment on things, like you know when you pay for a bus, you know it both it could cost money to catch the bus and it takes you time. So you could also in, in, incorporate uh, that that into the the metrics to then decide whether you should uh, use it or not right 